and song number 111, 111. Rescue the perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep over anyone, one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Though they may sign him, still is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if only if they only believe. Down in Uma's heart, crushed by the tempter, feeling life buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving arm, waking by kindness, cord that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, duty demanded. Strength for the labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently winding. Tell the poor wanderer as severe as die. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. By kind 
Let's close our eyes to pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you very much for this hour. Thank you for the spirits present to teach, to instruct, to admonish our hearts. Thank you because you give us hearts of understanding to your word and the grace to be doers of it in Jesus' name. As we speak to us, O oh Lord, Pray that our hearts will be quickened to respond, even to the heartbeat of God in reaching out to rescue the perishing in the name of Jesus. Let your name be glorified through the teaching, and let the blessings of obedience be our portion this day, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. Jesus' mighty name, we pray it. Amen. Welcome us to the period of searching the scriptures in Jesus' name. Uh, this morning we are looking at uh, study 947, uh, and the title is Personal Evangelism. Personal Evangelism. Well, before we go to what we have today, we want to briefly look at um, what we studied last week on the revelation of the glorified Christ and remind ourselves of those things that we learned uh, from the study, uh, revelation of the glorified Christ. Uh, we are told that the church today, uh, we are actually we are to be, to be encouraged that whatever we are going through now, our Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the Anointed One, the faithful witness, the One who rose from the dead with great power and glory. He is the Alpha, he is the Omega, he is the Almighty. That tells you and me that we believe in the risen Christ who is alive forevermore. And whatever we are going through, passing through today, we are assured of his presence, his power to see us through in Jesus' name. And of course, we know very well that he's coming back again. And he's coming back again for us as believers we are going to rejoice and be glad in Jesus' name. But of course, for those who are not ready, prepared for the coming of the Lord, certainly there will be gloominess that awaits them. My prayer is that you and I will be ready for God's Christ's coming in Jesus' name. And so this morning, quickly, we will look at our topic today, which is personal evangelism. Our memory verse is taken from John Gospel, chapter 1. And in verse 41, we want to uh, have somebody recite it for us. I committed it to memory, anybody? Yes, our sister. Our memory verse is found in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 41, which says, He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, 
we have found the Messiah, which has been interpreted the Christ. Thank you very much. Quickly, take your Bible and read our text for us. And um, our text is from John, Gospel chapter 1. We're reading from verse 35 all through to verse 51. John chapter 1 from verse 35. Again the next day after John stood and took off his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Servus, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than this. Verse 51. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Thank you very much. God bless you. Our text this morning um, actually reveals um, some specific um, Bible characters that actually demonstrated uh, practically an effective, very easy, exemplary personal soul winning strategy, which you and I will have uh, lessons to learn from. Looking at um, verse 35 and verse 36, uh, we are told here, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. That was John the Baptist uh, introducing two of his disciples to Christ. And in verse 40 and verse 41, and one of the two which had John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Andrew is mentioned here. And we are told he found his brother Simon, brought him to Christ. And if you look at um, verse 43, it says, The day following, Jesus will go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. All these actually, they are interesting uh, strategy that we, you and I today, we can adopt uh, in reaching out to soul, souls of men and women that we find all around us. Now, looking at John uh, the Baptist, we are told that he was not actually a selfish individual, indifferent to the plight of sinners, I mean, sincere seekers of the Messiah. That was why he pointed uh, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, to his disciples. And that's to tell us 
today that we also we can reach out uh, those who are underneath us, maybe as uh, employees in a place of work, we can reach out to them, tell them about Jesus. You have them in your place, I mean in your home, uh, in the families, maybe house help, drivers, cooks. These are people we can also introduce Christ to them. That was actually what uh, John actually is trying to uh, teach us. Andrew, likewise, we are told uh, he first finded his brother Simon and brought him to Christ. There are brothers, there are sisters, there are aunts and the uncles, uh, relatives we have far and near that we can also introduce them to the Messiah. By the grace of God, the Lord will help you, help me. We are going to achieve this in Jesus' name. Philip, on the other hand, a friend of his, Nathaniel, he also introduced him to the Messiah. He said, we have found uh, um, Jesus, the Messiah. And so he brought him to Christ. Christ actually is trying to tell us too that no matter what you and I are going through, the Lord actually wants us to identify with these sinners. If you look at what Jesus Christ himself said about Nathanael in verse 48, he says, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Jesus sees the sinners wherever they are. And like you are sitting beside them in the bus, Jesus sees them. And he's counting on you, tell them about Jesus. You see them in the hospital. Maybe you went visiting a loved one in the hospital. A sinner there, man or woman, young or old, uh, beckoning on you. That's exactly what the Lord is telling us. We need to tell them about Jesus. In the place of work, you are sitting with them, you know, as your colleagues or uh, you know, we need to really endeavor by the grace of God to reach out, telling them about Jesus. That's exactly what the Lord is telling us because He sees the sinners wherever they are and giving them opportunity by you and I, like Philip did. My prayer is that the Lord will help you. We're going to be like Philip to bring sinners to Christ in Jesus' name. Very quickly, we are going to look at three points in our study this morning. Point number one. We are looking at meaning and mandates of personal evangelism. Meaning and mandate of personal evangelism. Now, if you go to John chapter 15, we want to read just one verse of scripture there in verse 16. John 15, 16, Jesus Christ said, He have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Christ says he chose you for a purpose, and that purpose is to go forth and bring forth fruit. And of course, we are aware of the Great Commission, that he gave to the disciples and by extension you and I today. In the book of uh, Mark Gospel in chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, we read in verse 15, Mark 16 and in verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Christ commanding his disciples, those who profess faith in him, confidence in him, trust in him, those who loved him, with all their heart, the Lord is saying that he has given us this great commission that we should go into all the world, preach the gospel. And this mandate and this great commission is to every believer. Personal evangelism is a response to the most essential and urgent responsibility of the church to the Great Commission. Personal evangelism is just one of several methods by which believers can actually reach out to sinners, backsliders that are closest to them with the gospel of Christ. Personal evangelism is a person-to-person -person evangelism which enables the soul winner to meet and present the gospel of Christ to the unbelievers. The steps 
we are to take in reaching out to these sinners in personal contact with them. One, we must find the sinners, identify them wherever they are. The bus, in the office, in the airplane, your neighborhood, co-tenant, landlord, employees or employer, they are everywhere. We need to identify them. We need to find them where they are. That was exactly what we saw in the Bible days. In number two, we have to actually communicate the gospel to them. And that gospel is to point out the Messiah unto them. We see all the account we have read in our text. We saw how they pointed those individuals to Christ. If you look at Acts of Apostles in chapter 8 and um, read verse 35, there must be communication that is telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has accomplished for humanity. In chapter 8 of Acts of Apostles, we read verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Christ. You can see there, very necessary, that we must talk about Jesus to the sinner. Number three, you make every effort to lead the sinner to Christ. We must make sure that at the end of the day, the sinner actually understands Christ the Savior, Christ the Redeemer, Christ the Messiah, who has come to seek to save the lost. So winning is not complete till that sinner is won to Christ. Let's ask this first question. What does personal evangelism mean? Yes, can we have an answer? Yes, sir. Personal evangelism is the mandate of Christ to every believer. You know, to turn sinners to saints through the efficacy of sharing the word of God, you know, by person to person, you know, sharing of the word of God and uh, the gospel of salvation. Thank you very much. Personal evangelism is one on one with the purpose of sharing the gospel, the good news, and making the sinner to know the Savior, bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. My prayer is that the Lord will help you and me, will be faithful to this wonderful call the Lord has placed upon our lives in Jesus' name. We quickly go to point number two, mobilization of believers and urgency of personal evangelism. Mobilization of believers and urgency of personal evangelism. Because the, this great commission has been handed over to us, for you and me, the church today must do everything possible to ensure that every member of the church actually arise to identify with this great commission in reaching out to the souls of men and women, young, old, rich, poor, educated, illiterate, wherever they may be found. We need to mobilize every brother, every sister in the church. If you look at John chapter 4, I will read verse 35. John chapter 4. In verse 35, Jesus Christ told us, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. That's Jesus Christ telling us that delay can be dangerous. Delay can be destructive. Quite a lot of harm, damage can be done if we delay in reaching out. That's why mobilization is very necessary to make sure that these souls are brought in before it is too late. Paul the Apostle told, told us in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, and uh, we read verse 29. We're looking at the essence for every one of us to actually rise up and do something about the souls of these men, women, all around us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll read together verse 29. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and in verse 29. We are reading through to verse 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, 
for the fashion of this world pass it away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried, careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. What the scripture is telling us that, brethren, the time is short. And much effort must be given to evangelization of the souls of men and women all around us. As Bible students, we must remind ourselves that the world is living on borrowed time. And the multitude of souls are yet unprepared for Christ's coming. There is therefore the great and urgent need for the mobilization of every church member, beginning from the house caring fellowship, the women fellowship, the zones location and district churches. Efforts must be geared towards reaching out you know, to the souls of men and women. Take the gospel to wherever the sinners can be found. It will be too late to reach out to sinners after their death or the rapture has taken place. It is therefore, brethren, an urgent task for every believer to rescue these dying souls while there is still time. Or do we say we do not believe anymore in the reality of hell? Or are we talking about the souls of these men and women that the souls doesn't matter anymore, no value for these sinners' uh, souls? Or are we concerned? I mean, not really concerned about the shed blood of Christ for lost humanity. And that's why we need to look at all these variables and say, Lord, by the grace of God, you and I, we are going to rise up and do something before it is too late for these souls of men, women, all around us in Jesus' name. The question is, why is the task of personal evangelism necessary and very urgent? Why is it necessary and very urgent? Yes? Any answer? Very good. Can you give us an answer? Thank you very much. The certainty of hell makes it mandatory for every one of us to make sure that these souls do not end up in hell. Of course, we know the consequence of a soul uh, getting into hell. There's no repentance in the grave. And of course, because of the value of the souls of these men and women, the Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And that's why something has to be done to rescue the souls that Christ died on the cross, that he shed his blood on the cross. It is not in vain, brethren. And that's why we must do everything possible, rescue the souls, bring them in before it is too late. The Lord will help you and help me by the grace of God. We'll do something about the souls of men, women, in Jesus' name. What are the methods and procedures in personal evangelism? What are the methods and procedures? That's the third point uh, in personal evangelism. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and um, looking at verse 19, 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, and in verse 19, although I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. Verse 22. To the weak, Became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul is an example of a soul winner that made himself all things so that he could reach out to all mankind the high and the lowly, the educated and the literate. Now, these are people that actually Paul reached out to, and by the grace of God, he touched quite a number of the people in his own day. 
The same thing applies to us today. We must make sure that every effort that we make towards these souls that are there in the world is such that eventually they are brought into the kingdom. And so the efforts we are talking about is that, like we see in the case of uh, John Gospel chapter 3, we are told that Christ himself, uh, a religious man, came to him and uh, wanting to know uh, more about the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 3 of John Gospel, reading from verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God, for no man can do these miracles that doest, that thou doest, except God be with him. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ directly approached um, um, Nicodemus. In other words, we can make a direct approach to the sinners, men and women, and we can make a direct approach to those that need the gospel. Tell them clearly, distinctly, they must need to be born again. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ actually showed us. So the first approach is a direct approach, as we have just read in John 3, what? 1 to 3. Number two, there is also the indirect approach, like we saw in the case of Philip. Now, if you look at what Philip did in chapter 8 of Acts of Apostles, Acts of Apostles chapter 8, we see the indirect approach that he adopted. How did he go about it? He saw what this man was reading. He had what he was, what he was reading, and a question actually followed. If you look at Acts, I mean, Acts of Apostles chapter 8, and in verse um, 35. Okay, let's back up to the study four. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or of some other man? We are told that Philip then opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. But before then, he asked him in, uh, a question. He asked him, do, do you understand what you are reading? Because he had him read the prophet Isaiah, and he wanted to really explain that passage of scripture to him and ask him question do you understand what thou read it? in other words it was an indirect approach by asking a question and of course from that question philip now opened his mouth and uh, began at the same scripture and preached unto him jesus the same thing we see in john chapter 4 reading in john chapter 4 with our lord jesus christ the woman of Samaria, we are told clearly too that it was an indirect approach. She came wanting to fetch water, and of course Jesus Christ said, give me to drink. Let's read from verse 7. In verse 7, okay, right, but let's back up so that we understand exactly um, what they're saying. In verse 4, uh, Jesus Christ said, uh, verse 5, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. That was the question. Give me to drink. A request, actually, that Jesus Christ gave to her. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You know the story? From that conversation, of course, eventually the woman actually was brought to Christ. So the indirect method, actually, we can also adopt it, you know, with our friends around, our colleagues in the place of work, and those in the marketplaces as well. Indirect, you know, by asking a question 
I'm uh, looking at the situation of things. Quite a number of us will know what is happening around us today in the world as a whole. These are people exhibiting and um, expressing their fears of the situation or circumstance of things there. We can use that to introduce the gospel of Christ onto them. We can also adopt the friendship you know, uh, method. That is, we want to befriend these people with a view to preaching the gospel, introducing Christ unto them. It's very important for us to understand that if we come in a friendly manner, the Lord will open their heart to receive us. And before you know it, the gospel of Christ, we can preach unto them. We have quite a lot of literature today that we can also adopt in reaching out to uh, the sinners out there. A lot of magazines that the church has printed, quite a number of tracts that we have. We can also introduce this to our listeners, I mean our friends in the place of work, in the marketplaces, in the buses, we can actually introduce these um, literatures to them. And from that, we can com begin a conversation uh, by trying to make them to understand the saving grace of the Lord. After fellowship approach is another method. We have five uh, newcomers coming to the church. At the end of the service, Let's make effort to reach out to them, get to know where they stay, get to know where they come from. And of course, we can actually, from that, we establish them by the grace of God. And uh, their questions, their doubts, we can actually attend to them. Once the door of soul winning has been opened and the most suitable approach decided, the next urgent task is to ensure the presentation of the gospel in a very simple and clear manner that will actually bring the sinners to the point of decision and surrender to Christ. In accomplishing this great task, therefore, we, brethren, we must give ourselves to much prayers. It's very important for us to emphasize uh, the need for prayers. The hearts of these people are sealed up by the devil, and it takes prayer to break into their hearts. And by the grace of God, the Lord will open their heart to the gospel in Jesus' name. The devil actually does not want such individual to be released because he imprisoned them, bound them, chained them, and it takes prayer interceding uh, to really break the yoke of uh, the devil over the lives of this world so that their eyes can be opened, their eyes of understanding can be enlightened uh, to understand the saving grace of the Lord. And so, if you and I are faithful to God and faithful to the Great Commission, and bringing these sinners to the kingdom, the Lord says we are wise servants. And of course, God in turn will definitely reward every one of us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God this morning, as we have heard, listening to this uh, personal evangelism, you and I, we need to examine ourselves. Are we actually involved? Are we engaged in personal evangelism? looking at the place where we come from, the places where we engage uh, in our daily activities. There are many sinners out there within our locality. We need to really identify them and communicate the gospel unto them. And of course, prayerfully believing that the Holy Spirit will open their heart, give them understanding to salvation in Jesus' name. Brethren, the time is short and it depends on you and me to make hay while the sun shines. The Lord is coming and of course, the situation of things we see around uh, our world today, bringing fears, bringing unbelief and uncertainties of life. And that's why we need to carry the gospel that bring comfort, soothing comfort to their souls, and of course, getting them ready for the coming of the Lord. We are going to rise up now and talk to God and say, God, I'm going to give myself to personal evangelism, my spirit, my soul, my body. I want to humble myself before the Lord and let God use you, use me, and accomplish this task in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's open our mouth and pray and talk to God. Are you engaged in personal evangelism in the home, in the family? We have quite a lot of tenants around us. We have maids around us, our drivers, our cooks. Do we share God's word with them in the place of work? Do we actually reach out to our colleagues? Do we actually touch them with the gospel of Christ? In the marketplaces, they are everywhere. Brethren, in the buses, in the vehicles, they are everywhere. We need to touch them with the gospel of Christ. Reach out with the tracks, reach out with the magazines, touch them. Let the Holy Spirit enlighten their heart to the salvation of God. 
Let's pray that God will help you, help me. We engage ourselves in personal soul winning. And as we engage in preaching the gospel in season, out of season, the hearts of these people, by the grace of God, will be touched and there will be salvation. Hearts will be touched, there will be restoration, renewal in their spirit, soul, and body in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's talk to God that God will help you, God will help me. And the church all together, as we go back to our districts, location churches, want to mobilize the body of Christ, want to reach out with the gospel. Let's spend and we'll be spent tracts and magazines. Let's get them out and uh, put it in the hands of these, our brethren. And of course, let's encourage them to go out, identify with this personal soul winning. The Lord is coming soon and we need to be prepared. We need to get the people prepared. We need to get the souls of men ready for the coming of the Lord. As we engage in soul winning, my brother and sister, your labor of love will be rewarded in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let's talk to God that God will help you, God will help me, and the entire body of Christ, the Lord will assist us, and we are going to be faithful in reaching out with the gospel of Christ to all and sundry in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. We give all the praise and worship to you, Lord of heaven, for speaking to us again to remind us of this onerous task of reaching out to the souls of men and women all around us in personal, friendly, saving way. How we pray, O oh Lord, you grant your mercy, loving kindness to the hearts of our friends, our neighbors, as we carry the gospel to them, open their understanding, enlighten them to salvation in Jesus' name. Every yoke Satan has brought to hinder them, Lord, giving their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of your spirit, the Lord, will liberate them all together in Jesus' name. Every yoke of sin will be broken, every bondage of sin will be destroyed, and the liberty that Christ purchased with his own precious blood on the cross will avail for such ones in Jesus' name. Lord, whatever method, approach we adopt in reaching out to these souls, ultimately, is to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Lord, give them understanding to salvation in Jesus' name. And we trust that the reward that awaits wise men, men and women, wise brothers and sisters who engage in evangelism, reaching out to the souls of men and women, the reward will never pass us by in Jesus' name. As we continue, Lord, we pray your presence come to with us. Jesus' mighty name we pray. It. We rise on our feet as we sing from gospel hymns and song. One one three. Go and tell the story. Go and tell the story to the today. How the Lord of Glory made thee on the way. How He cleansed thy spirit from the stain of sin, driving out the foes with who reign thy heart within. Go and tell the story of his power to save, of the sinful legion sunk beneath the wave, tell of his companion, of his love so true, of the wondrous thing the Lord has done for you. Go and tell the story how he reigns above, winning men to glory through his dying law, how he waits to crown them kings forevermore in his own awaiting on the other shore. Go and tell the story, tell it far and wide. How the Lord of glory for the sinner died. And the soul that he is and in faith believes, straightway he, the cleansing from the Lord's receive.
And song two five seven. Two five seven. Jesus sent more laborers. Jesus sent more laborers. For Lord, we see the end. The land is ready for harvest. They feed our life indeed. Lord, we love our country. Can't let love life to be won. Jesus, bring revival. That through us, your will be done. Lord, we sense your moving, touching our lives with power. We are ready to serve you, to go this day, this hour. O oh Lord, but start with me. Jesus, begin with me. Who will go for you, Lord? Who will go for you, Lord? Here am I. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me, Lord. Send me.
shall go to God in prayer. In Isaiah chapter 6 and in verse 8, also I add the first of the Lord, saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? Then as I said, then said I, Here am I, Lord, send me. We want to pray this morning for the marvelous grace of God upon our life, that the Lord will send us to the lost world. We are ready, O Lord, to go anywhere he send. We will be willing to obey Without partiality, total obedience to his word, to his will, to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, and to bring them out of this dungeon of sin, and to bring them to light and to glory. Let me get a personal commitment this day. We are saved, we are delivered, we are free. We are to go with burden, with prayer, with passion, to rescue them and to bring them out. Let's pray that the Lord will make you and I living ambassador, holy ambassador, ready to, to go for them, go after them with passion, with prayer, and to bring them out from the ocean of sin that they are into. Let's pray that the Lord will help us with the burden to go in there, to go out there into the war. 
As I said, here am I, Lord, send me. He saw the name. He saw the name. And he said, here am I, Lord, son, send me. Empower me. Endew me. And let me go. I want to pray that Lord will make us to be available. And we are available and we go and do the bidding of the Lord. We are safe to serve. That the Lord will help us. We arise and we do the bidding of the Lord. Even in times like this. In times like this. Where the world needs a savior. We will make it known. And we make it known to everybody. To see and to embrace. So that the blood of Christ. Will not be in vain in their life. Let's pray. It's a clear on call. Are we willing to do. To go for the Lord. And to do the bidding of the Lord. In times like this. In Jesus name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. It's time for us to give our tithes and our offering unto the Lord. I read in Malachi chapter 3 and in verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that they will meet in my house. And prove me now, here we say the Lord of old. If I will not open you the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive them. And I will rebuild the devourer for your sake, and he will not destroy the fruit of, the, of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast out fruit, neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, say the Lord of old. Our tithe is the one tenth of our gross earning, and anything above it is our offering. We want to read them up right now as we pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you this morning that we are not come before you empty-handed. In perfect obedience to your word, we have brought this lead to, O Lord, as tithe and as an offering for the work of the Lord to grow and to, to be expanded. How we pray in your loving kindness, you will bless all these hands that are raised up in return in Jesus' name. Hundredfold, you got unto them in return in Jesus' name. And this will be used for the expansion of your of the kingdom even here or not in Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let's drop the tithes, the offering, and the bag being passed across while we still continue in the month of prayers. In Psalm 103 and in verse 1. Here is what the Bible says as we look. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are these benefits? Who forgiveth all their iniquities? Who healeth all their diseases? Who remained alive from destruction? Who crowned it with loving kindness and tender mercy? These are the marvelous things the Lord has done for us. And for this purpose, we want to appreciate God in his power and his love. Who saved who redeem and who grant total freedom to us that we can gather here in holiness, raising up holy hand before him. Let's praise this God and worship him and honor him and adore him. For the marvelous thing, we are saved, we are delivered, we are made whole, we are set free in freedom, spiritually and physically. Let's magnify the name of our God and praise his wonderful name. Let's worship him. Holy Father, righteous God, let's magnify his holy name. He healed us in time past. He's still healing today. He will still heal in the future. He forgive all our sins. He heal all our all those terrible things that the enemy has thought is done with. But can see the mighty hand of God. Let's appreciate the doing of the Lord in this area. Day by day, satisfy our mouth with loving kindness and tender mercy. Let's worship God. Let's adore him and magnify the name of our God. Let's worship him. He's the almighty God. Let's magnify him. He's the holy God. Let's exalt his holy name. It's a wonderful, marvelous, gracious deed in our life. Worthy of all praises, worthy of all adoration. Let's magnify this God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Prayer for the church. And I read in Luke chapter 18 and in verse 1. Luke chapter 18 and in verse 1. Prayer for the church. And he speak a parable unto them to this end. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. And in verse 8b, nevertheless, when the son of man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? He want to pray at such a time like this. The faith of the church will remain unshakable in Jesus' name. 
Let's pray that the God of mercy, he will ignite the real fire of revival, fire of holiness, fire of restoration, fire of faith to stand for what we are, we are known for, for, what we believe in the Bible, that we will stand like this. The church will remain unshakable despite all the news in the community globally that God will help the church. What we believe, we will hold on to him. Faith to the end. Our faith will not fail. The harm of God will be real upon our life. We believe the Bible. We will stay with the Bible. We will stay with the word of God. We will stand where the Bible stands. Let's pray. All those who are thinking of one thing or the other, God will bring them back into the forefront of faith to stand for the truth, to stay with the truth, and to abide with the truth. And the glory of gospel of our Lord and Savior will be real in every life. Let's pray for the revival of holiness, Revival of righteousness in such a time like this that our faith will stand on God unfailing promises. Let's pray. God will keep the church. God will keep the church. The Lord will preserve the church. And as we are preserved, we will be ambassador. We will be salt. We will be light in the world. And the glory of gospel of our Lord and Savior through all will beam the light across every nook and cranny of this nation, in our community, in our local government. We make known the power of his saving grace. Let's pray. Heaven will help us. The hand of God will be real upon our life. And we make known the power of his saving grace. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The Bible says we are the light of the world. And we are the salt of the earth. We want to pray. The church will stand. Not polluted, not corrupted, not defiled. In Jesus' name. Amen. And every same member of the church, of the visible church, we will carry the gospel light to every nook and cranny of this nation in Jesus' name. Let's pray. We had today personal evangelism. We'll be involved. All of us will be involved. In our new town, anywhere we find ourselves, in the bus stop, at the hospital, anywhere we find ourselves, we will beam the light. We will beam the light. We will beam the light to those who are in darkness and they will come out. They will embrace the light. They will embrace Calvary. The blood of the Lamb we say we deliver and we, we set free. Let's pray. Oh Lord, the fire of revival. Ignite the fire of revival. Ignite the fire of renewal. Restoration of gospel of peace in every life. That we will be Holy Ghost carrier and we dispel the light into as many that come across our way. Let's pray that the church will not be weakened this time around, but we stand unbendable, undefeatable, unchallengeable, unstoppable. And the hand of God will be upon our life. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Still praying for the church, that the church will be rapturable. That the church will be rapturable. Our eyes, our gaze will be on Christ the coming king in Jesus name. Let's pray. We'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. We'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. There will be no defilement. Our faith will not be weakened. The hand of God will be real upon our life. Let's pray. Oh Lord, make your people ready. Make your church ready. This time around, our eyes will be on him. The immaculate God. The everlasting God. The coming king. And we rise. We will rise. Ride. We will ride. We will be available. We will, be, we will hear the gospel call. We will be awakened by the spirit man. Let's pray that the Lord will help us. Let's pray that the mercy of God will be real upon our life. In Jesus mighty name we pray. We want to pray for the missionaries, the overseers, and all the pastors, and all the workers in the church. That at such a time like this, great to hold on to the end, heaven will bestow upon all of us in Jesus' name. Let's pray for all those in the troubled spot in the world. All our missionaries who are holding for, they will hold for. They will continue. Great to continue. Strength from above. Courage. Heaven will bestow upon them. No looking back. Having laid their hand on the plow, they will not look back. God will keep them. Heaven will keep them. Mercy of God will be available unto them. At such a time like this, their faith will stand on God on failing promises. Let's pray. The Lord Lord will keep them. All our missionary, all our overseers, all our city overseers, they will stand for the truth at such a time like this. Let's pray the glory of God will be upon them. 
the hand of God will be upon them. The mercy of God will be upon them. We will rest upon them. They will they have been defending the truth. They will come to stand for the truth. And the, stand, the truth of the word of God will stand with them and be with them. Let's pray. Grace to hold on. Heaven will grant unto them all. In Jesus' name we pray. Still pray for all the workers in the church and all the pastors in the church. I want to pray. None of them will be like Demas in Jesus' name. None of them will be like Judas in Jesus' name. None of them will be like Saul, the first king of Israel in Jesus' name. As they begin with the law, they will continue unto the end in Jesus' name. Pray that the Lord will hold every worker in the church, every member in the church. The truth that we have been exposed to, that we know we keep the truth. God will help us to keep the truth, undefined truth, uncorrupted truth. We will keep and the mercy of God will be real upon our life. Let's pray all the workers, all the ministers, everybody will be on their duty pole. Not like demons, we will not love the world. Not like Judas, we will not love material things. Not like Saul the first king, we will not love power and we leave the thing that matter most. Heaven will keep all. The mercy of God will be real upon our lives. In time like this, we hold on, we hold for to God unfailing promises. And his mercy will be re upon our lives. Pray, the hand of God will be re upon the church of the living God. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Prayer for our nation. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. If my people... Which are called by my name, shall I humble themselves and pray and see my faith and turn from their wicked way? Then will I hear from heaven? I will forgive their sin and I will eat their land. We want to pray that God will defend and cleanse this nation in Jesus' name. We want to pray that God, in His mercy, He will stand down His heavenly ambassador to defend and to cleanse this nation from all pollo pollution, corruption, and defilement in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray. Oh Lord, arise for the sake of the elect in this nation. There was, if we will pray, we will seek your faith, you will arise. Lord, we pray, defend this nation. Defend the nation and all rid us from corruption, from defilement, and let the church be let this nation be open for the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, arise. Defend this nation, oh Lord. Cleanse this nation, oh Lord. And the Lord God of heaven, he will, he will arise. He will, he will arise. And the glory will be seen upon this nation. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's plead for mercy. Let's plead for mercy that God will look up from heaven and he will cleanse this nation, he will defend this nation. Let's pray. For the sake of the elect, God's mercy will be seen. His hand will be seen upon this nation. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to pray that God will arrest every negative wind in this nation in Jesus' name. The passive pandemonium want to pray. The northern wind, the eastern wind, heaven will stay them from this country in Jesus' name. Pray that the hand of God will be real upon this nation. Remember, Moses prayed. He said, glory over me. And all the lies, all the frog, they were taken away from the land of Egypt. And the prayer of the man of God want to pray. We are here as heaven sent ambassador. We want to pray. No evil wind will blow into this nation that we call catastrophe. Let's pray the mercy of God will be real upon this nation. The hand of God will be real upon this nation. For the sake of the elect, this nation will be preserved. Will be preserved. Will be preserved by the hand and the mercy of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Still praying for the nation. We want to pray. All those who have been affected by the virus. We want to pray divinely by the blood of Jesus. There will be an injection of the power of God into their life and they will be healed miraculously in Jesus' name. That they will give testimony. This is nothing but the hand of God in their life in Jesus' name. Let's pray that the Lord will hear. God will eat them all. All of them. The hand of God will be real upon them. Let's pray. 
Let's pray. If we believe the Lord, the Lord will do it. He will do it. And they will say, this is nothing but the finger of God. Oh Lord, arise in your finger. Oh Lord, arrive with your glory, with your mercy, and prove that you are the Lord who ruled in their fears of man. Every demonic inspired diseases and then will come to them. Because our God is ruling in the affairs of men. And they will hear and they will answer our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' glorious name we are praying. Prayer for our GS, for our pastor. We want to pray and ask the Lord that the hand of the Lord will rest upon our Father and the Lord continually and continually in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray that the mercy of the Lord, the hand of God, and his mercy will be real upon his life day by day. Paul the Apostle said, pray for me that all trance will be given unto me, that all trance, power, unction, anointing will rest upon our Father and the Lord more than ever before in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and pray. The mercy of God will never cease in his life. Heavenly and Heavenly outpour of anointing, unction, heaven will rest and will bestow upon him more than ever before. Let's pray. Let's pray. Define strength, define ability. Heaven will get unto him more than ever before at such a time like this. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to pray for every member of the family that the Protective arm of God will be upon our mother and the Lord and upon all the children in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray. The mercy of God will surround them more than ever before. The cloud of glory will rest upon them more than ever before. Let's pray that our mother and Lord will be a supportive arm that he has ever been for the ministry at church a time like this. Let's pray for open heaven. Let's pray for open heaven. Every weapon form again that will never prosper. The glory of God, the hand of God, the mercy of God will be real upon the man of God and upon the entire household. Let's pray that God will perform the glorified Christ will be real upon his life. Pray and upon the family as a, as a oh. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to pray for the whole world. It's not, it's not got news that only Jesus is the solution to the problem in the whole world. And we want to pray from Nigeria here that as we send out the prayer, every country that has been affected right now, they will see the wave of the hand of God in Jesus' name. The evil tide will cease in Jesus' name. The demonic inspire affliction will end in Jesus' name. Let's send the prayer across the wall. We are started, we want to pray because we are here. We believe you. Bible says, and we stand upon the unchanged word of God. We want to pray right now. Every demonically inspire affliction and disease, whatever their name is, because we are here and we send the wall. Let an end come to it right now. Let it go back to where it came from. Go to the abyss. Let it walk. Let it cease in operation. And let an end come to all those things that the devil has set in play. Evil will not happen until we are rapture. Until we are all from the planet earth. We want to pray. Let the peace of God rule and reign in every country of the world. In all the country of the world. Let the power of God be real. And be seen by the mercy of God. Let's pray. Heaven we hear. And heaven we answer all. God will be glorified on our behalf. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We are here today. We want to pray and ask the Lord. Our purpose of coming here will be fulfilled and realized gloriously in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Every guardian of the people of God today in all the churches, the, man, the hand of God will be real. As God is visiting us here, God will visit them in all their locations in Jesus' name. Pray and ask the Lord, open heaven. Open heaven. God will open the heaven on behalf of every one of us. Let's ask the Lord. The 
hand of the Lord will be real upon the church. Real revelation. Restoration of glory of God. The power of God. And the mercy of God will be revealed. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you. Thank you, Lord, for this gathering. Thank you for your hand of mercy upon all. Thank you because we know each time we call, you are always there to hear and to answer us. Blessed be your wonderful name, everlasting King of glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for our nation, Nigeria, and we are praying. And then we come to every corrupting influence, defining influences in this nation, in Jesus' name. For the sake of the few elect, Heavenly Father, we are praying. You will defend this country in Jesus' name. You will defend this country from corruption in Jesus' name. From affliction in Jesus' name. Lord, you make a prayer concerning Jerusalem. You say, for my servant David's sake, I will defend this city. Father, we are praying. For the sake of the elect, defend this country from maruders in Jesus' name. And let your perpetual hand be good in Jesus' name. I will pray for all the missionary, O Lord, all the minister, O Lord, outside the country. Father, we pray, all those in the troubled world, we are praying, grant them peace in Jesus' name. Let there be righteousness in Jesus' name. Let the arm of God be real upon them in Jesus' name. If, when they thought they are alone, Father, we pray, bear them up on the eagle wings in Jesus' name. We are believing you, Heavenly Father, beyond our expectation, that Lord, they will be hearing news of breakthrough from them in all their, uh, in all their posts in Jesus' name. Amen. Loving God, we bring our Father and Lord before you, more than ever before, your continued hand of grace, unction, fresh anointing, will be upon him more than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen. As his age, so I strength be in Jesus' name. And for the entire family, we pray protection in the day, protection at night. We be upon them for good in Jesus' name. And the glory of God will be seen beyond human comprehension upon them all in Jesus' name. I will pray, Heavenly Father, because you are the Lord who never fail. The entire church will be ready, rapture in Jesus' name. Our faith will never fail in Jesus' name. In time like this, you will make us living ambassador to go to all the nook and cranny of this nation, of this continent, to make no Christ the saving Lord in Jesus' name. And the blood of Christ we avail upon the continent, upon the world in Jesus' name. Father, we bring an end to every demonic pandemonium going on in the world in Jesus' name. We stop the tie right now in Jesus' name. Have your way, Heavenly Father. And for today, worship service all over the nation, we pray. Let the finger of God be seen in Jesus' name. Let there be hope in heaven in Jesus' name. Continue to bless us, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the answer. In Jesus' glorious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's please be seated. We are all welcome to today's Sunday worship service in Jesus' name. It's a prayer that as we keep coming for all this meeting, the blessing of the Lord will rest upon our lives in Jesus' name. Let's take this weekly meeting's announcement. Every week in the Bible Church, we have three important and distinct meetings. On Sundays, we come together for the Sunday worship service. That normally start by 7.45 in the morning. And as we keep coming in our different districts, the blessing of the Lord will rest upon us in Jesus' name. Mondays in the Bible Church are days of systematic and expository study of the Word of God. And for years, this has been our Bible school and at the backbone of the church. We want to please ensure that we keep coming. And as God has been our Father and Lord, to really bless us. The blessing of God will continue in our life every now and then in Jesus' name. 
the meeting starts by 6 o'clock, but transmission starts by 7 o'clock every Sunday in our location, in our district churches as well. On Thursdays are days of miracle, revival, and training in evangelism. And every Thursday we come together in our little location, in our small cell, and we listen to the word of God, where we celebrate the defeat of Satan and the future of Christ in the world. As we come every 6.30 in the evening in our little cell, the hand of God will be real upon our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Later in the evening on Sunday, we have the, the house can fellowship system where we meet together. Our children and our youth meet by 4 p.m., where the adult meet by 5 in the evening. It's a small cell where we know ourselves. There is caring and there is sharing as we pray together and we bear one another body. As we keep to all this meeting, the blessing of the Lord will rest upon our life graciously in Jesus' name. We shall have a brief period of scripture reading. Romans 4. Romans 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, Faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, 
who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many." And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen. Ready at 
Cry aloud for bread, with the bread of life, they are longing to be fed. Shall they starve and famish, while a feast is free? I must be more faithful, here am I, send me, here am I. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I said, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for we thank the Lord for our worship service today. And we know it's a special service, it will be special for you. Amen. I said, It will be special for you. Amen. And the Lord will bless you and through you bless many other people in Jesus' name. Amen. Here am I, send me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our worship service. We bless your name because we know you are already here with us. Thank you for all the areas and all the sections of the service. And thank you for everything we have learned. We pray, Lord, that this time you speak to everyone definitely and distinctly in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you strengthen us to take this gospel and the word of the Lord, the word of salvation to people who are perishing outside so that they will come to life eternal in Jesus' name. Send us, Lord, and make us effective as you send us. Reveal to us the depths of what Christ has done for ourselves, for our neighbors, for everyone around. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. A good amen before you sit down. Amen. God bless you. We're looking at John today. And as we look at John today, we're reading from some selected verses. I'm reading from verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John said, Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God. We take us away the sin of the world. That's how we came to the Lord. That's why we came to the Lord. And that is what brought us to the Lord. 
the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, sent from above into this world, not only to look at what we're doing, or to look at a situation, or to sympathize with us, but to see a predicament, to see the consequence of our sin, of our evil, and then pay the price, the penalty of our sin, and take us away from sin, take sin away from us, and then bring us, reconcile us to the Lord. All that he came to do at his first coming. And John said, and was still saying today, and the Spirit of God is saying today to everyone, Behold the Lamb of God. Come to verse 36. In verse 36, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. You cannot reveal the Lamb to another person except to you yourself. You have benefited from the ministry and from the mediation of that Lamb. You must behold the Lamb. You must believe the Lamb and you must become a transformed person, a changed person, a child of God by beholding and be believing the Lamb before you can tell him, before you can tell other people what he has done. We're coming to First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. It says, For as much as she known that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father's but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb. Here the apostle Peter is still emphasizing that Christ is the lamb. But it's not just the lamb uh, there without being slain. He had to be killed. He had to shed his blood. And it is the blood of that lamb, the spotless blood. And it is the blood of that lamb, the sinless blood. It is the blood of that lamb, the perfect blood, the heavenly blood. It is the blood of Christ, the Son of God himself, that saves us. That's why he says, we're saved, not by silver, not by gold, from the tradition of our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The lamb. The Son of God, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb that is without blemish and without spot. It tells us that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is the center of man's redemption. Without him, there's no salvation. Without him, there's no redemption. Without him, there is no, there's no hope of heaven. But Jesus Christ becomes not only the center of man's redemption, it becomes the center of God's righteousness. That is for the righteousness of God to pass on to you to pass on to me and the righteousness of God to become ours. Christ is the center. It's not the work of our hand. It is not the labor of our hand. It is not anything we can do, not religion, not tradition, but the Lamb, the Christ of God, who shed his blood for us, he became the center of God's righteousness, the central avenue by which his righteousness comes to us. Not only that, it's the center of the sinner's reconciliation. If the sinner is going to be reconciled with God, Christ is the center. And Jesus is the redeemer, is the one that is the bridge between the sinner and the holy God to live link us to the almighty God. He is the center of the sinner's redemption as well as reconciliation. We know that the saints are going to reign in the eternal kingdom of Christ. How is that going to happen? Christ, the Lamb, is the center of the saints reigning in the eternal kingdom. We're seen without the Lamb of God. There's no life. There's no eternal life. 
There's no abundant life. There's no everlasting life. Without the Lamb of God, there is nothing that links us up with God to live with Him throughout eternity. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, we still have the Lamb being exalted. He is a Savior. He is a Sanctifier. He is a Redeemer. He is a Redemption. He is all in all for us. In Revelation chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 13. Here are people now that are redeemed. Here are people now that have left this world and they have gone to the great beyond. They have gone to glory. And the reason why they're in glory and the reason why they are saved, the reason why they have the qualification or to enter into the kingdom is because of the Lamb. Look at that again in Revelation chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 13. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, what are these which are rich in white robes? Whence came they? Look at verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, out of great trial, out of great trouble, out of great persecution. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of the Lamb. That's the only means by which you can be saved. That's the only means by which we can come into the kingdom and enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. The benefits of the King of Kings. The benefits from the Lord of Lords. Today we're speaking on our full redemption through the Lamb of God. You as a believer yourself, you need to understand that Christ provides full redemption because he's the Lamb of God. And as we go out to talk to other people, to bring them into relationship with the Lord, we need to make them understand that redemption, total redemption, full redemption, redemption now and redemption ever, redemption for the spirit, for the soul, redemption for the body, everything that uh, uh, com uh, comprises of redemption in the Lord, we have through the blood, through the blood of the Lamb of God. Of God, our full redemption through the Lamb of God. There are three things we're looking at in the message. Number one, the provision. Number one, the provision. That is the provision of the Lamb. It's coming from the Lamb. It's because of what He has done. It is because of His death, substitutionary death for us on the cross of Calvary. That's how we have that provision. Number one is the provision of the Lamb. Number two, our privilege through the Lamb. He has made the provision. And he has provided all that we'll need that will link us with God and take us to God in eternity. Now we have the privilege, our privilege through the Lamb. Number three is the pattern of the Lamb. The pattern of the Lamb is left a legacy for us. It's left a pattern for us. It's left a way of life for us. It's left the standard for us. And we find the pattern in the Lamb, the pattern of the Lamb. Go over that again. Number one is the provision of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelation. The provision of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelation. It is not an afterthought. It is what came from Genesis all through the Bible and then goes to the time and the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The provision of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelation. Point number two, our privilege through the Lamb in the generation of the righteous. Our privilege through the Lamb in the generation of the righteous. There, is, uh, there are generations of sinners. There's also the generation of the righteous. The people who are righteous from time immemorial, from the time of the first sacrifice, the time of Abel and Enoch, and Noah and Abraham from that time until the time that the last person will get into the kingdom and be saved and be a righteous person redeemed of the Lord, the generation of the righteous, our privilege through 
the lamp in the generation of the righteous. Point number three, the pattern of the lamp in gentleness before raining. In gentleness before raining. It's going to rain and we're going to rain with him. And he gives us the pattern, the pattern of life we ought to follow. In gentleness and meekness before we rain with him. Point number one, who has number one to tell me over there? God bless you. The provision of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't mean we're going to read all the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but I just want, to, I want you to see the revelation of the Word of God and the institution of the Word of God concerning the Lamb of God, concerning what He's supposed to do and what He will do for everyone, what He has done for us and what He's still here to do for us from Genesis all through to the book of Revelation. We're coming to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. You know the story here? This is when God called Abraham and said that he should bring his son Isaac and sacrifice him on the altar. We're looking at Genesis chapter 22 verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamp for the offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamp for the bond, for a bond offering. So, they went both of them together. A sacrifice was to take place. And in this sacrifice that was to take place, Abraham was going with Isaac. And there was no lamb. And there was no sacrifice. And then Isaac asked, My father, aren't we forgetting something? And we leaving the real sin that we ought to take along with us? And we leaving that behind? And Abraham said, no, not at all. We have not forgotten anything. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And then Abraham said, my son, God will provide. And he has provided. Jesus Christ was the one to come. Remember that Abraham was representing God, standing in for God, and Isaac was representing the only son, the only begotten son of God. And Jesus Christ was to be sacrificed for us. He was to become the lamb for us. And here is the first place where the revelation of the lamb for sacrifice, of the lamb as substitution. Eventually they go to the place of sacrifice. You know what happened? That Abraham laid Isaac on the altar and then God said don't lay your hand on him don't touch him and as he looked up he saw the lamb provided by God Christ has been provided for you as the lamb was provided for Isaac to be a substitute for Isaac in the same way the Lord Jesus Christ the lamb of God is your substitute the punishment you shall have carried, he carried that punishment. And all the burning of eternal fire you should have carried, he carried that for you. He paid the whole price. And so you understand, it is not by your feeling, it is not by your religion, it is not by your church denomination, it is not by your affiliation with anybody. anybody. What I mean, a body of believers, is not that. It's Christ the Lamb that has become your substitute and because he paid the price, you don't have the price to pay again. You don't have the punishment to pay again. He has taken everything away. You are free in Jesus' name. You remember, after, after Isaac came out of that and the lamb was sacrificed, Abraham did not say, even though the lamb has been sacrificed, I say, come and lie down there, you will still pay the price. No, already Christ has paid your price. It's the lamb of God. That's why John said, behold the lamb of God. 
God that taketh the sin of the world away. He has taken your sin away. Look at Exodus chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 5. Exodus chapter 12, the revelation of the provision of the Lamb from the time of Genesis going on until the time of revelation. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 5. It says, your Lamb shall be without blemish. Your Lamb shall be without blemish. Already the Lord is telling us, the one that will come that will be able to take our sin away must not have seen himself one sinner cannot redeem another sinner one sinner cannot pay the price for another sinner a sinner will have his own price to pay him and so he cannot pay for another one but jesus christ that is represented by this lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats it says look at verse 12 here in verse 12 of that same chapter it says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. That's uh, representing the whole world. Judgment is going to come upon the whole world. But God said, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, behold, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, when I execute judgment, I am the Lord. And the blood, that's the blood of the lamb. Remember in verse 5, he said he should select the lamb. The lamb without blemish and the lamb without any spot. They shall select that lamb and kill that lamb and then get the blood. The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, somebody there tell me, I will pass over you. When he sees the blood applied by faith, applied by trust in the Lord, that it is not me, it is the Lamb that is going to be uh, the source of my salvation and of my redemption, and you believe in the Lamb. You behold the Lamb, you believe the Lamb, and the blood has been shed, and you are taking that blood by faith. It's applied to your soul by faith. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Come to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. We're reading from verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. The many people that are trying to worship God in their own way, and they're trying to get salvation by their own effort, in their own strength, but without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no redemption, there's no reconciliation, and there's no righteousness. It says in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. It says, for the, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. To make an atonement for your souls. You cannot atone for your soul by good works, by anything you render to God. It is the blood of the lamb, the spotless lamb that makes atonement for the soul. And it says it is given. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And it has been given for you and given for me. And I pray all the things that the atonement has provided for will be yours in Jesus' name. Let's quickly go to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, we have been talking about the lamb. And the Lord has been showing the lamb is coming. The lamb is coming. All you see in Genesis. All you see in Exodus. All you see in Leviticus. And throughout the Old Testament, they are symbols, they are representations of what the lamb, who the lamb actually will be. But now it's going to be more definite about the revelation concerning the lamb. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 53. And I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 4. Surely 
he has borne our griefs. It's showing you now because he uses the pronoun he. It's no more talking about the animal. The animals are going to be set aside. The new covenant is going to be uh, enacted. And that new covenant will have the Lamb of God, that is Jesus himself. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him, streak him, and smitten of God. You see, he's talking about a man now. He's talking about uh, the real Lamb of God represented by those uh, uh, by those uh, bees and animals, it says, and it's afflicted. But he was wounded for transgression. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for iniquities. He was bruised for my iniquities. I thought you'd say that for yourself. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his tribes, somebody there, we are healed. Look at verse uh, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep. All we, everyone. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Have you noticed uh, that word all there? Start from verse 6. All all we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at what follows. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And he talks about in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin was I born. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's unlimited atonement that Christ has come to make. It's not just atonement for some, atonement for a few people, atonement for everyone. It says, he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Are you included? I said, are you included? All your iniquities, everything you have ever done wrong, small and great and big and terrible, whatever, everything has been bundled together and he has laid the iniquity of us all on him. If I were to break up that word lamb, L-A-M-B, we'll be talking about limitless atonement, meriting or mediating blood. It is the limited atoning meritorious blood of Jesus Christ. It's limitless. It's not limited to people in the south or people in the east or people in the north or people in the black race or people in the white race. It's limitless atoning meritorious blood. It has been shed for everyone and he has laid on him all your iniquity. You will not bear the punishment of those iniquities anymore in Jesus' name. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb, that's the word again, as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his his mouth is talking about the lamb eventually as you come to the new testament and we're reading from acts of the apostles acts of the apostles chapter 8 the uh, eunuch of ethiopia was reading what we have read now in isaiah that he has laid the iniquities of, of us all upon him and i was wondering who is this is the prophet speaking about himself is he speaking about another man and the angel told uh, Philip go near to that chariot and join yourself to that chariot we're coming to Acts chapter 8 and we're reading from verse uh, 28 he was returning and sitting in his chariot he read Isaiah the prophet then the spirit said unto Philip go near and join thyself to this chariot and Philip ran see that to him and heard him that read the prophet Isaiah and said, 
understandest thou what thou readest? We could ask that question. You've read Genesis chapter 22. Understandest thou what thou readest about the father sacrificing the son and about the substitute that came? Understandest thou that thou readest what that that is referring to you as we think about the lamp in Exodus? Understandest thou what thou readest that when I see the blood of the lamp upon you, not your feeling, not your effort, not anything, but the blood of the lamb i will pass over you understandest thou what thou readest when we read in uh, leviticus that have given the blood and the blood is for the atonement of your soul understandest thou what thou readest and then we come to isaiah he laid all your iniquity everything you've done wrong he laid everything on the lord jesus christ and he carried them away as far as the east is from the west he has taken all your iniquity from you, understandest thou what thou readest? There are many people that still read today, they don't understand that that app applies to them. They don't understand that this is for them. And the moment you believe, the guilt of sin is gone. The pollution of sin is gone. The power of sin is broken. And the eternal punishment of sin is taken away. Thank God I understand what I'm reading. I said, I understand what I'm reading. I pray the Lord will give us deep understanding of what we already understand in Jesus' name. And he said, understandest thou what thou readest? Verse 31. And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? How can I accept some man should guide me? And then it goes on to say, and he, and, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb, that's the lamb again, as a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. And in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, I'm asking you now, of whom speaketh this prophet, the prophet this, of himself or some other man? And Philip, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him. Somebody tell me, Jesus preached Jesus unto him. You understand? Jesus is the Savior. You understand? Jesus is our sanctifier. That spotless lamb, that smitten lamb, that slain lamb, that sinless lamb offered and sacrificed for you and me and for the rest of the world is the one that became number one man's substitute. Man's substitute, the sinner's substitute. Number two, he became the sinner's sacrifice. There's no other sacrifice, no sacrifice of animal, no sacrifice of even human labor or human effort. He, Christ, the Lamb of God, became number two, the sinner's sacrifice. Number three, he becomes a sin bearer. It's the one that took all our sins away. You know, sometimes after you are saved after you are born again you have believed on the lord jesus christ because of being a human being the remembrance of what you did 30 years before 40 years before 50 years before might come to your mind and some people who do not understand that that is just your feeling they'll go and kneel down again oh god i remember 40 years ago 45 years ago i remember 50 years ago forgive me forgive me already has taken that away and the lord is wondering what are you talking about he erased that from his own record he erased that from your history and you will never come across that thing again they are sunk in the sea of god's forgetfulness they will never be brought back to you again in jesus name number one our substitute number two our sacrifice number three our sin bearer number four he is a savior he is a savior when we call him savior Savior, we call him by his name. He's the lamb that came to save us from our 
our sins. Actually, that is double fold. It takes us from sin and it takes sin away from us. In taking us away from sin, the salvation. In taking sin away from us, he is our sanctifier. He gives his sign into our nature, into our heart, into our soul, into our spirit, into our inner man. And he takes the sin, the original sin, and the inbred sin, and the depravity, and the internal sin. He takes that away. Thank God, he is your sanctifier. Your savior. Your sanctifier he is a shepherd too because he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid his, laid his uh, life down for the sheep. And because he is a shepherd, I shall not want. All your needs he'll provide. Your needs of today, your needs of tomorrow, your needs for life, and your needs for eternity, he will provide in Jesus' name. Remember now, he's a substitute. Remember now, he's a sacrifice. Remember now, he is our sin bearer. Remember, he is a savior. Remember, he is a sanctifier. Remember, he's a shepherd. Remember, he is a security. It's a security. As long as we stay inside that house and the mark of the blood is on the lintel of the house the angel going around to destroy those who do not have the mark of the blood of the lamb the angel will not touch you you are secured today and you are secured in your soul in your spirit in your life you're secured forever as as long as you abide in him you're secured in jesus name and then he is a sufficiency there is nothing you need you say oh i wish christ had provided for this he had provided for everything when you were younger your needs were limited he provided for everything now as you're growing older your needs are expanding and the lord has supplied and is going to supply everything in Jesus name. When you meditate on these words that this is the Lamb of God and the Lamb of God has become your substitute, thank God I've escaped judgment. I said I have escaped judgment. Is a sacrifice. I don't have to do have any other sacrifice. Do I sacrifice this, sacrifice this, sacrifice that? He is the final sacrifice. Is a sin bearer. All my sins are gone. I said all my sins are gone. You know, I say confidently because I'm sure. How do you say your own? All my sins are gone. They are gone in Jesus' name. Are you saved? I said, are you saved? He is your savior. Are you sanctified? He is your sanctifier. He is your shepherd. He is your security. He is your sufficiency in Jesus' name. You know, we talked about the provision of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelation. I've just read Acts of the Apostles unto you. I'm reading to you now once again in First Peter. And I'm reading from chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15 now. First Peter chapter 1. And I'm reading to you you from verse 15 in first peter chapter 1 reading from verse 15 look at what it says over here it says as obedient children in verse 14 not fashion yourself according to your former laws in your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy and if he call on the Father, or without respect of person, judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but... What has redeemed us? But somebody there with well, the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Remember, 
all through from Genesis Revelation, this Lamb of God is presented, is proclaimed, is provided, is revealed unto us. We're looking at Revelation now again, chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, we have the Lamb in chapter 5, we have the Lamb in uh, chapter 6, we have the Lamb in chapter 7, we have the Lamb in many places in Revelation. But let's just look at this. Revelation chapter 7, reading from verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Stop there for a moment. When you will get eventually to heaven, you will find that the blood of the Lamb has redeemed such a great multitude that no man could number. Isn't it unfortunate for some people that even though there are so many people, multitudes that will be saved, they count themselves out of all the, not only millions, but billions and billions and billions of people that no man could number. Their names are written in the book of life and somebody is uh, kind of isolating himself and somebody is separating himself and somebody is uh, taking himself out of this great number. Thank God I'm of this number. I said I'm of this number. I pray that your name would not be missing on that final day in Jesus' name. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, Nigerians will be there. Ghanaians will be there, every African country will be there, and all the other countries of all nations will be there in Jesus' name. You know, some people say, Baby, I'm born here, I'm born here, it's unfortunate, I'm born in this place. Anywhere you are born, the Lamb is available for everyone, and the redemption is available for everyone. It's of all nations and kindreds and people, and tongues that stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Lamb. And before the Lamb, we will stand before the Lamb. Clothes were white robes and palms in their hands. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, the living creatures, and they fell before the throne and they fell on their faces and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Somebody help me shout Amen there. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders uh, answered, saying unto me, What are these? Who are these? Which are red with white robes. And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, persecution, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, at they before the throne of God because their robes are washed, because their lives are cleansed, and because they are cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. That's the only reason. That's the only reason. Could your tears forever flow? Could your zeal no respite? No. All that for sin cannot atone. Is the Lamb, is the blood of the Lamb alone. And because of that, therefore, at day before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb is the Lamb. All the way through is the Lamb of God. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them. And shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. Can I make that personal? God shall wipe away all tears from my eyes. Make it personal. Say it. Say it. 
you will wipe them away in Jesus name and before we leave that point number one remember only through Christ only through the lamb only through the savior only through our shepherd only the through the Lord Jesus Christ we have number one reconciliation with God reconciliation with God he is the one that brings us to God and is the one that wipes all our sins away and now we're reconciled unto him number two we have restoration to godliness restoration to godliness what Adam lost that godliness that nature of God were restored to that through the blood of the lamb reconciliation to godliness number three the righteousness of God the righteousness of God not the righteousness of the Jews not the righteousness of the old covenant it's not the righteousness of man it's not the righteousness of human effort the very righteousness of God we have through that blood of the lamb righteousness without guilt i pray that all your guilt will vanish away you'll never feel them anymore in jesus name number four is redemption through grace redemption through grace that's what we have because of the blood of the lamb because of what he has done we have redemption through grace number five we have recovery of his goodness all the goodness of god that heals us all the goodness of god that provides for us all the goodness of God that makes us to be what we ought to be that um, that recovery you will have in Jesus name number six is the riches of the gospel the riches of the gospel the gospel provides a lot of riches for us and we have that through the blood of the lamb and then number seven number seven is readiness for glory readiness for glory I pray the blood will pro properly cleanse you and totally cleanse you and prepare you you'll be ready for glory in jesus name when the trumpet shall sound you'll not be dumb you'll not be deaf you'll not be asleep you'll be awakened and you will hear and through the faith you have in the blood of the lamb you'll be ready for glory in jesus name you have them all reconciliation with God you have them all restoration to godliness you have everything righteousness without guilt you have everything redemption through grace and you have recovery of his goodness you have the riches of the gospel and by the grace of God by the grace of God you'll be ready for his glory we come to point number two now our privilege through the lamb in the generation of the righteous let, let me first of all a uh, clear uh, those uh, words for you generation of the righteous anything like that generation of the righteous look at this we're looking at us uh, in the psalms we're looking at psalm 14 we're looking at psalm 14 and i'm reading from verse 5 we're reading from Psalm 14. We're reading from verse 5. It says that they were in great fear. The people that do not know God, the people who have not been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, there they were in the fear, in fear. For God is in the generation of the righteous. God is in the generation of the righteous. You know, as we're here today, this is the congregation of the righteous. It's the assembly of the righteous. It's the fellowship of the righteous. When you put all of us together, all the believers, all the children of God together, we become a generation, a royal priesthood and a holy nation, and we're the generation of the righteous thank God I belong to the generation of the righteous do you I said do you I said do you you belong to the generation of the righteous and nothing nobody will take you away from that generation in Jesus name now we're looking at the privilege we have through the lamb in the generation of the righteous so coming to Isaiah Isaiah chapter 53 in Isaiah chapter 53 we're reading here from verse 6 again to refresh our memory it says all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned 
Elijah, everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet we open, he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is seed dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from the from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for it was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken he was bearing the punishment of her transgression and it says and he made his grave in verse 9 of the wicked and of the rich in his death because he had done no violence spotless holy, righteous, sinless, blameless. He had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, put, he has put him to grieve. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, a sacrifice for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see his travail, the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, justify many, justify many, and part of that many. For he shall bear the iniquity. Therefore will I divide him a portion or the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bared the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. He's talking about the privilege we have or what transgressors, but now all those sins are taken away and we now have the righteousness of God because he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we made a great exchange. He took our sin and we got his righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Reading from verse 21, it says, For he has made him to be sin for us. He has made him to be the sin offering for us. He has made him to be the sacrifice for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took your sin and he gave you his righteousness. We have his righteousness. I have his righteousness. You have it in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, it's repeating what Isaiah has already told us. And this is uh, putting a New Testament freshness into what we have read into the, in the Old Testament. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, were justified. And it is free. It's done everything for us and we accept that and we appropriate that and we receive that by faith and it says in verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare clear his righteousness for the remission for the removal for the forgiveness for the cleansing of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of, of him which believes in Jesus as we believe in him he has justified us. 
He has taken our sins away. And now he gives us his righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 5. We're reading from verse 17. It says in verse 17. For he by one man's offense death reigned by one. Much more. They which receive the abundance of grace. How much grace have you received? I said how much grace do you have? Abundance of grace that covers every evil sin that you have done in the past. And of the gift of righteousness. It says now we shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Your reign. Even in this life, you will reign in Jesus' name. And of course, in the life to come, you will reign with Christ. We're coming to Romans chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 6, verse 18. Being then made free from sin. Free from sin. You are not a slave of sin anymore. Free from sin. Sin is not your master anymore. You have dominion and you have it through the blood of the Lamb in Jesus' name. It says, being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Look at verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life amen. amen how did we have that romans chapter 10 in romans chapter 10 we're reading from verse 8 it says in verse 8 but what says it the word is near you even in thy mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith which we preach you hear the word of faith and if you receive it as the word of faith, and your faith mixes with that word, everything Christ Calvary has provided will be yours in Jesus' name. That if, in verse 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lordship of Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Look at verse 13. You are going to read verse 13 along with me. One, two, three, go. You need to read that again. Read it well in unison and accept it. Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever. There's nobody exempted. Whosoever. He paid the price for everyone. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's come to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And here we're reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 7. Look at what it says in verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is the lamb again is the marriage of the lamb that has now come and his wife the bride has made herself ready you'll be ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints the lamb is the lord and he has granted us what we could not attain or obtain by self-effort what Christ has done is what we could not do for ourselves. He has given us righteousness in salvation. He didn't just uh, put his stamp of salvation on us and put his label on our forehead, saved, saved, saved. But he gives us righteousness along with that salvation. And I pray that will be practical, definite in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. He has also given us holiness in sanctification 
sanctification. It's not just we have a label, sanctified, sanctified, sanctified. He gives us holiness in that sanctification. He gives us godliness or spirituality. We're filled with the Holy Ghost. We're filled with the Spirit of God. And with that spirituality, He gives us godliness. All we need to do is repent, turn away from our sin, believe, turn to the Savior. All we need to do is consecrate and totally surrender everything to the Lord. And we'll seek Him and we'll seek His glory, His glory only. And everything will be ours in Jesus' name. Everything will be yours. Because of what he has done, all the blessings we need, all the blessings you require will be yours in Jesus' name. Let's look at First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 24. Who is his own self bear our sins, carried our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, dead to sins, dead to sins. You'll be dead, totally dead to sin in Jesus' name. I hope you understand what that means. Let's say, for example, a man had been a drunkard, a smoker. Anytime he sees a bottle of his uh, favorite uh, alcoholic drink, he rushes after it. But now the man is dead. And because he's dead, that bottle owes no attraction to him anymore. A person is a smoker and can smoke anything or everything. But now the man is dead. The sin holds no attraction anymore. Now we are dead to sin. And that sin will not have any attraction to us in Jesus' name. That we should live unto righteousness. Now you are righteous. Now we are righteous. But the blood of Christ and the cleansing of the blood makes every one of us righteous. And the last line of that verse 24, are you there? The last line of that verse 24, I said, are you there? Why don't you read it and let me hear your voice. Uh, that's your voice. I thought uh, your voice was kind of a shepherd and that let me hear your voice. By whose stripes you are healed. You are healed. I said you are healed. You know, there are some people, they carry their feelings about, they say, uh, they're not even sick yet. They're not even sick yet. They say, eh, Pastor, I'm going to get sick. I said, how do you know you are going to get sick? He said, I just feel, I just think, I just, I just hope I'm going to get sick. So I'll be calling you on phone, you'll pray for me. I'm not sick here, but I'm going to get sick. You will not get sick. You are not making preparation to be sick because he has carried all your sin, has carried all your sicknesses, all your infirmity. He has carried everything away in Jesus' name. By whose stripes ye were healed. Now, you notice something. When you read in Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah says, by whose stripes ye are healed healed because the sacrifice was still about to come now the sacrifice has been made everything is now available he now says in the past tense by whose tribes tell me you are healed you are healed already we'll come to point number three now and point number three is the pattern of the lamb in gentleness before reigning for you to understand uh, what we mean by this uh, subtitle i'm going to read uh, chapter five of revelation revelation chapter five and i'm reading from verse one revelation chapter five we're reading from verse one it says in verse 1, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed were seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon look at that no man on earth no man in heaven no man under the earth, no man anywhere was able to take the book out of the hand of the almighty and open it and read it the one that takes that book and the one that opens that book will be unique 
like no other person, incomparable. Look at verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open or to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, weep not, weep not. Beloved, the Lord is saying, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book. And John, who received this revelation, will be looking for a lion. But look at what follows in verse 6. And behold, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, huge, tell me, a lamb, instead of a lion, a lamb, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth on into all the world. The lamb became the lion. Is the lamb that was slain that now came and took that from the hand of the father. The point is, it was a lamb before becoming the lion. He was meek before becoming mighty. He was gentle before becoming a governor. He was dedicated before having dominion. He said, I came to serve like a, like a servant before he had sovereignty and that's what the Lord is telling us that in the same way what our lamb has done our savior has done the lamb that became the lion the reigning Lord he was first the Messiah he was first the mediator before he became the mighty one ruling in majesty he has given us that pattern and we ourselves too we must follow that pattern of life that we're meek before we become mighty. Let us look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 28. Matthew chapter 11. Reading from verse 28. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will give you rest. He has given you rest already. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That's the lamp now. Me can lowly in heart, but later it's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And ye shall have rest, find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my body is light. While we're on this side of heaven, that's what we're going to manifest. We're going to manifest meekness and gentleness before we reign with him. But reading from Matthew chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 25. Matthew chapter 20, we're looking at verse 25. In verse 25, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. We minister to each other. We serve each other. We love each other. And we cater for the need of each other. It says, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, is still going to minister unto, and is still going to be the Lord, is still going to be, be the reigning governor, but now he came to serve and to minister. That ministry first before he comes to reign, and that's the pattern he has led for us. He says is to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. It tells us in Psalm 18, Psalm 18, we have to be gentle, we have to be meek, we have to be loving, and then later, as we follow the pattern of the Lord, we will reign with him in Jesus' name. Psalm 18, 
We're reading from verse 35, Psalm 18, reading from verse 35. It says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Thy right hand has holding me up. Listen to this. Thy gentleness has made me great. Let's look into our lives. Let's follow the Lamb. Let's follow the pattern of the Lamb. It was gentle. It was lowly. It was meek. It was humble. And we need to follow that pattern of life. Gentle and meek and lowly and humble. It says, Thy gentleness has made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not sleep. Your feet will not sleep. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 10. In Second Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading the first part of verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 1, the first part. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. If we proclaim Christ, if we preach Christ, and if we talk about Christ to other people, and even among ourselves, let's have the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Christ. And you know the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5? Galatians chapter 5, we must have this gentleness before we reign with him. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 22. In verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. What's the next word there? gentleness, goodness, and faith. That's what we are to have. And meekness, gentleness, meekness, lowliness, humility, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. In Second Timothy chapter 2, Second Timothy chapter 2 is talking about the attitude and the action of the pastor, of the minister, of the preacher, of the worker, of the Christian leader towards the people that may not be standing right and we need to help them to counsel them. Look at what we ought to have as part of our characteristic in helping the people that have gone astray. It tells us in Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Let me read that verse 24 again. The servant of the Lord must not strive. Everybody say, must not strive. God forbid that we ever strive with anybody in Jesus' name. We don't strive at home with our wives and husbands. We don't strive at home with those who are working with us. We don't strive in the office. We don't strive. We don't fight with anyone. It says the servant of the Lord must not, not me, not, must not, must not strive, but be, how? Tell me, tell me. If that's what you are going to do, say it aloud. The servant of the Lord must be gentle to which kind of people? Amen. Brother, why are you rough with that person? Pastor, you don't know this person. The fellow is rough. And you know, if you don't uh, get rough with him like that, he doesn't understand gentleness. Gentleness is not his vocabulary. And therefore, if you want him to understand something, you have to be rough with him. How many people are we to be gentle with? All men, but be gentle to all men. God give us the grace. God give me the grace. He'll give us the grace in Jesus' name. Apt to teach patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. We're going to have the nature of Christ. And when we have the nature of Christ, it's an assurance. When Christ comes, we're going to reign with him in Jesus' name. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 2. Titus chapter 3. 
and we're reading here from verse 2. We're going to be gentle before we can reign. Titus chapter 3, we're reading from verse 2. It says there in Titus chapter 3 verse 2, it says to speak evil of no man and to be, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto how many people? Unto all men, unto all men. In James uh, chapter 3, James chapter 3, we're reading from verse 13. James chapter 3, reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, James chapter 3, who is a wise man, who is a wise believer, and endured with knowledge among you. Let him show of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom, meekness of wisdom. But here, if ye are bitter, envy and strive in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom that strives, this wisdom that fights, descendeth not from above, but is earthly and sensual and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom from but the wisdom that is from above is first, is first, then peaceable, and what follows? Gentle and easy to be entreated. And it says it's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteous is sown in a peace of them that make peace. We'll be all be peacemakers in Jesus' name. Christ is coming back. And Christ is going to reign. And when he comes, he'll find you ready. He'll find me ready. And we shall all reign with him in Jesus' name. I thought you would say amen. amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're reading from verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Reading from verse 23. It says in verse 23. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward they that are Christ at his coming then cometh the end when he shall have when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of god even uh, to god even to the father when he shall have put all rule down all rule and all authority and power because for he must reign he must reign he must reign and you reign with him Till he has put all enemies under his feet. He will reign and we shall reign with him. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6. And he has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To, the, uh, to him the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And then he says, since he has made us kings and priests, look at what is going to happen. Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 10. And he has made us unto a God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Read that for yourself. And he has made us unto a God, kings and priests, and... Uh, we shall reign on the earth. That latter part again, and we shall reign on the earth. And we shall reign on the earth. Remember, you have meekness before you have might. Meekness before might. Remember, gentleness before governing. You are going to govern, you are going to reign. Gentleness for dedication before dominion. You are going to have dominion, but you must have dedication of servanthood before sovereignty, purity before power, righteousness before reigning, holiness on earth before a home in heaven. There's a place prepared for you in heaven. You'll be there. I will be there. We shall be there. Holiness of heart now before a home 
in heaven. He has made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You will reign in Jesus' name. Make sure we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Make sure that we have the mark of that blood of the Lamb upon us. It's made us righteous. It's made us holy. It's sanctified us. It's a substitute. It's a sufficiency. Give yourself fully. Surrendered unto him once again. And on that final day when the trumpet shall sound, you will hear, you will rise or the people. You will go up with the saints of God. You will reign forever and ever with the Lord in Jesus. Jesus name. Let's rise up now and confirm it before the Lord in prayer and say Lord I'm waiting for that day. I'm waiting for that time and I know I'm going to have all this privilege. Know the provision of the lamp and know the privilege we have in the lamp and know the pattern that he has set for us that he has for us. Open your mouth and tell the Lord oh Lord make me part of it and make me to be partakers of that of your coming in Jesus name. It will happen it will happen open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer
What's she doing? Blessing. Exalting. That he has counted you and I worthy. Worthy to be called. Among the generation of those that are righteous. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Give honor to the lamb. The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Rejoice, be glad. And also bless him because through that sacrifice, through the cleansing in the blood of the Lamb of God, we also have the privilege to be partaker of the benefits that Calvary has procured for us. Bless the name of the Lord. What shall we say about the privilege of the healing of our bodies by whose Christ who are healed? He was not only nailed to the cross, he was tied to the pole, he was beaten, and his body was lacerated, broken. And through the brokenness of his body, we were healed. And this morning, just like a father in the Lord has taught us this morning, the Lord has paid it. He has paid the price. Appropriate that provision that Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary and receive your own healing this morning. Who in his own body bear our sin in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose tribes we were healed. Live unto righteousness. And by his tribes we were healed. The account is settled. And the transaction has been made by whose scribes you were healed, done. Bless the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ came, he became sinner's sacrifice, he was a substitute, he was a savior. He was a sanctifier, a shepherd, a security. Remember also, it's your sufficiency. Sufficiency in all things. Bless the name of the Lord. Through his death on the cross, he brought reconciliation to God. Restoration to godliness. Righteousness without guilt. Redemption through grace. 
you now recover all through his goodness in our lives bless the name of the lord he has given us a pattern pattern of gentleness and he has told us that if we are going to reign with him there is need for us to be gentle the servant of the lord does not strive we don't strive with anyone we are gentle jesus christ even when he was he was spoken against beaten he didn't say anything he was gentle even to the point of death that's the pattern he has given us are we gentle are we meek before we can become mighty there must be meekness Tell the Lord, Lord, make me meek. Make me gentle. Like my Savior, my Lord, my Master. The one that has given me an example that through him, through that example, I will also pattern my life. Help me this morning, Lord. We cannot govern, we cannot rule without righteousness, we cannot govern without gentleness. Lord, this morning I come, do the work in me. Help me to live the life that is Christ glorifying in the mighty name of Jesus. Do the work in me, Lord, this morning. Do the work in me, Lord, this morning. Through this message that you have sent to us, turn everything around in my life. Make me the man, the woman I ought to be for the glory of your name. That when anyone sees me, they will see Jesus in me. The meekness of Jesus, the gentleness of Jesus, the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus, the unbending commitment to seeking the lost like Jesus did. Lord, do that work in me this morning in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. A righteous, loving, wonderful Father. We want to thank you very much because of the way you have ministered to us. Thank you because each time we come into your presence... You always open our eyes to discover new things in your word. Your word is ever new. Every time new to us. This morning, we want to appreciate you, Lord, for the full redemption that you brought to us. The Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. We thank you because... We are privileged to have experienced this redemption, this cleansing, this purging. Lord, this salvation that you have given unto us. We thank you because the either two wall of partition that separated us from you through the death of the cross. You pulled everything down and we have unfettered access to the to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. Heavenly Father, 
We appreciate you for Jesus. For what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. And for the blood he shed. For the remission of our sins. We give you all the glory in Jesus name. And this morning you have challenged us. That we need to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And lift him up as the lamb. Because we cannot preach the real gospel if we don't declare Jesus as the son of God, as savior. And we don't declare that it's only through him salvation can be gotten. Because there is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. But the name Jesus Christ. Give us the grace to do it in Jesus' name. And as we declare your word, Father, we pray as we lift up Christ, the Lamb of God, we pray that all men will come to you in Jesus' name. You said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me through us. Draw men unto you in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.